There's a dominant life form on this planet, and it isn't us. We may dwarf individual bugs, but collectively they have a larger impact on our lives than we can possibly imagine. They were here 400 million years before us. We invaded their territory. From the bug's perspective, we're just another habitat ready to be colonized. They're infesting all our lives, watching, waiting for a chance to invade. And I was in tears because I knew my house was being eaten and there was really nothing I could do about it. Because once these things get in, they're almost impossible to get rid of. Health officials say they will continue spraying across the city. I'm telling you, at night, I, I can hear them. I can hear them. If you thought bugs were just a nuisance to be tolerated in our world, think again. Because it's you who's living in a bug world. But it seems like about 500 of them climb up your leg and then all of a sudden say, sting. Ooh, look, here we go. Our homes are infested with bugs. It's been this way since we lived in caves. We tried everything to keep them out, but the bugs are penetrating all our defenses. They're invading our most personal of spaces. Um, I believe there's some holes in the screens. I, don't, I think this fan has something to do with it. I'm not sure, but it's, there's one right there. Oh, he just left. They're huge. Over 70% of all the animal species on this earth are bugs. There is no avoiding these intruders. Here, where they have little cracks. Since we can't get rid of them, then our only hope is to find out more about them. But to do this, we must step into an alien world where our human perceptions are turned upside down. For now, only one thing is certain. They are closer than you think. The mosquitoes are definitely in my house. Yeah. Yeah, they're definitely, you can hear them. If you still believe that your life is somehow bug free, then this man is your wake up call. There are bugs on all of us. You mean I have them on my face right now? I believe you do. You want to come over and check it out? Come on. Our doubting sound man is offering a random sample of the human face for microscopic examination. Here's a slide. And uh, the bobby pin. Remember to scrape hard, but no blood. We all have relatives of the spider living on our noses, eyes, and foreheads. Don't see much. Try this here. Not much is known about these creatures, but Cliff Dash knows it all. He's a world expert on the human face mite. If anyone can find them, he can. There's a lot of cell debris on here. That would be typical of anybody. The way they feed is that the mouth parts are like two little needles, a pair of needles that they can stick out and they puncture one of your skin cells and the contents of the cell then leaks out. So the diet that they have is basically a liquid diet. Yes, you do. You have both species. <laughs> no amount of scrubbing will get rid of these intruders, but they seem to do us no harm. So I shouldn't feel bad that I have... Uh... No, you should feel absolutely normal. This one, by the way, happens to be a male. They're not real speed demers, but they do get around. Oh, there's an egg. See how the egg is an arrowhead shape? This is a male. Uh, in order to mate in the hair follicle, the male has to slide underneath the female and seminate her because the one right above it is a female and just behind the last pair of legs, there's the genital opening and that's where he would inseminate her. Oh, well, this one shows a nice thing. 
and these look like little loaves of bread sticking out of the hair follicle. There's, looks like maybe three or four adult mites right here. You can just see these things move, slightly moving too. They're all still alive. How these stowaways get onto our skin is not clear, but there is an unusually high concentration of them around the nipple. It would seem they start moving onto our bodies from the first sip of milk. One species of face mite was not described until 1972, but this invader has been around for as long as the devil himself. They are familiar to everyone in town and country and are notorious for their unpleasant habits. Their liking for human food brings them forcibly to our attention. It's not so much their liking of our food that should concern us, it's their method of eating it. They trample over everything, tasting through their feet. Then they vomit digestive enzymes and suck up the dissolved slush. Flies cannot be tolerated even in small numbers. Apart from being objectionable in themselves, they can be responsible for cross-infection. That reputation for danger is well-founded. A fly's foot can carry 100 different pathogens. It need only touch down for a moment to deposit a legacy of cholera, typhoid and dysentery. One dirty footprint can seed millions of bacteria and fungal spores. Throughout human history, the fly has spread disease and death. Hardly surprising that we like to kill them. New bug killer discovery. Raid contacts and kills all kinds of bugs indoors. Raid hunts them down like radar. Weeps bugs from the air. <laughs> them as they crawl and kills them dead. Not all bugs are temporary invaders like the fly. Some have moved in for good. They've swapped their wild habitat for your kitchen cupboard. We've stored processed grain for so long that these beetles now eat nothing else. But they are the least strange of your cupboard stowaways. The drugstore beetle can live off a diet of nothing but chili pepper. The cigarette beetle was once confined to the tropics, feeding on the fallen leaves of tobacco plants. Now, cigarettes provide them with a takeaway service all over the world. Inside the cupboard, there is a thriving ecosystem. Some bugs are not just fond of living with us, they've become dependent. These larvae are living on a diet of aspirin. But being a specialist like this has obvious limitations. The ultimate invader would be a bug that can live anywhere on anything. It's called the cockroach. Cockroaches are such nasty little creatures. It could be in a break room like this, in any business or institution anywhere. They could be in the appliances. Like um, I know at one university, they took their coffee pot apart and found them in there. They could be in the microwave, in the electrical appliances. It could be up in the cabinets, up under the shelves. Be over in the refrigerator, or anywhere, cracks and crevices. Just never know where they are. Most people are just totally disgusted by the little creatures. Total revulsion to them. Again, like I said, they could be up under this table, up in this food, anywhere, you just never know. Jerome Goddard is the medical entomologist for the state of Mississippi. In the warm southern states of America, they have government departments set up specifically to deal with the problems of infestation. In 1997, the USA spent an estimated $500 million on cockroach pesticides alone. We thought we could beat this bug with poison, but we underestimated the enemy. 
If you continue to treat a population of cockroaches with a particular pesticide, they become resistant. In fact, after a while, they're saying, squirt me, baby, give me more. They love it, they, or seem to love it, or are totally unaffected by it. A long time ago, pest controllers used to talk about eradicating cockroaches from your home. That was the big word. Well, then they realized that didn't work. So they started saying, we'll do cockroach control. Then they realized that didn't work. Now you hear them talking about cockroach management. We'll manage the cockroaches to an acceptable level. We do need to manage the cockroach because they don't just stay in the kitchen. They're feeding in the bedroom too. They eat anything organic, and as any bug hunter will point out, humans are organic. Cockroaches particularly like to chew on the fingernails of young children. I've been in places where there's just millions of cockroaches, like a horror movie. When you turn that light out, they come out at night, they crawl around, they crawl over people and babies and pets. They might be chewing on the fingernails or eyebrows or eyelashes. There have even been reports of children completely without eyelashes because of cockroaches. And when a cockroach is disturbed, its instinct is to run for a dark hole. In the hospitals of Jerome's hometown of Jackson, cockroach ear is a well-known affliction. In this war, a pest controller must know what he's up against, and the cockroach is a special challenge. It has two brains, one in the head and one in the rear. We have evidence of that. You can cut the head off of a cockroach. It can live a long time, even without its head. We have to be careful not to get its legs. Yeah, just like that. Cut the head off. Now I'm going to flip it up, see if it'll run. Look at that. Thing's just fine. It can run, jump, walk around. Can't eat, obviously. But everything else seems intact. They'll jump, move, bump near them, they'll run. People say they'll live up to about seven days with their head off. If a bug can live for seven days without a head, then anything seems possible. In this alien world, all rules are out. Nothing is sacred. Investigating the bug's world is like stepping into another universe. We're discovering animals that have powers we never dreamed possible. Hatching from this cocoon is a wasp that has a sense of smell that humans would love to harness. The tiny wasp spends its tiny lifespan hunting down tiny caterpillars in gigantic fields. For the wasp, it's a survival strategy. For us, it's an opportunity. To find out how they hunt down the caterpillars, scientists in Tifton, Georgia, have entered into a partnership with this bug. They're using bribery to tease out the secret behind the wasp's sensory skill. It turns out that the wasp is not sensing the caterpillar itself, but chemicals from the freshly eaten edge of the leaf. This lets the wasp pinpoint its prey from over a mile away. Rewarded for divulging its secrets, the wasp injects the caterpillar, but not with venom, with an egg. For this is a parasitic wasp, and its young grow in the body of another, eating the caterpillar from the inside out. This larva will hatch into a wasp that is a detection machine a hundred times more acute than any human invention. These super-sensitive bugs may well be the sniffer dogs and mine detectors of our future. One day, we may use a whole range of bugs to smell for us, to hear for us, 
and to see for us. This man has dedicated much of his life to the bug's visual world, and he's taking a new look at the original insect invader. If you want to catch a fly, you can take advantage of his Achilles heel, which is that he jumps into the air before he flies off to a point just behind him and about an inch above. A trained athlete couldn't anticipate this fly. But this man knows something we don't. Gets the fly, and there it is. At the Fly's Eye project at Cambridge University, Simon Laughlin and his team have spent 20 years trying to read the mind of the fly. To do this, they must literally get inside its head. What I'm going to do now is cut a hole in the cornea. It needs to be about a few facets across, so we're talking about a very small hole. Bring it up to the cornea, like that. We insert small electrical probes into the eye and the brain of the fly to discover what's going on inside the fly's eye and brain when it's seeing things. The recordings that we get from the brain of the fly tell us how an animal's eye can see things such as movements. that a fly sees like this. In fact, its brain fuses together the images from each facet of the compound eye to form a blurry and unimpressive picture. But Simon has discovered that there is something very impressive going on. Their perception of movement is unrivaled. The flies have excellent ability to resolve rapid changes in time they probably have the fastest vision that's known at the moment in the animal kingdom, and they're able to see changes in light level five or six times faster than we're able to see them. This means a fly virtually sees in slow motion, a crucial skill when you live under the noses of lumbering giants. It's as though we share the same physical space but inhabit different dimensions. Cockroach's perception of our world is no less outlandish. The tiny hairs on its antennae can taste a single molecule as well as detect minute changes in temperature and humidity. But they are just the short-range end of its sensory equipment. They have a long-range system too. These Circe on its tail plug into its second brain. They're exquisitely sensitive to the pressure waves generated by movement. The only thing I can relate it to would be like being in a jet airplane. There's wind blowing against the plane going 400 miles an hour, and it would be like the pilot saying, we've got a 10 mile an hour wind from the left side. That, that's just what it's like. These cockroaches can, can somehow know amongst all these sounds, waves, vibrations, movements, they somehow know what's different or threatening. The cockroach can sense you through its Circe long before you can see it. They filter out the confusing jumble of pressure waves and focus in on the one that spells danger. They can react faster than we blink. Just because your kitchen appears empty, it doesn't mean it wasn't crawling moments before.
Invasion by flies and roaches is bad enough, but things get far worse when the trespassers come armed with venom. Take Sydney in Australia. Today, over three million people live here. But long before they arrived, this area was home to the deadly funnel-web spider. On warm January nights, the spiders emerge like spirits from an ancient burial ground, out to haunt the new inhabitants. In reality, it's all about sex. They're out hunting for each other. But towards dawn, frustrated males are still roaming the streets looking for a mate. This cat's in no danger. By a strange quirk of evolution, humans are the only mammals here affected by their venom. These spiders have some of the longest fangs in the business and a bite that puts our body systems into overdrive, pouring tears, mucus and sweat. Without treatment, you can drown in your own body fluids. If you're uh, fiddling around in the garden at the moment, you might keep an eye out for funnel web spiders. Six Sydney people have been treated for bites in the last few days. The current heat and humidity providing apparently the ideal breeding conditions. And uh, all this coming at a time when the anti-venine is in short supply. The spiders are just looking for some daytime shelter. But if disturbed, they will attack. Funnel-web spiders are temporary invaders in our homes. They return to their holes in the ground as fast as they can. But in the United States, the sheltered nooks and crannies of our houses are exactly what black widow spiders are looking for. These deadly arachnids are moving in for good. Each year, two and a half thousand people are bitten. They bite very defensively and they defend their web heartily. So if they perceive you to be messing with their web, they will bite you. Dr. Rick Clark works with San Diego's Poison Control Unit. Black Widow bites are his speciality. Hi, Poison Control, can I help you? I got bit by a black widow. And you saw the red hourglass on the belly? Yeah. Okay, and you don't hardly see any bite mark whatsoever? It's just a little red thing. That's right, that's typical black widow. People will complain of nausea and vomiting. They get extremely high blood pressures in some situations. She has been vomiting and, and she's just in a lot of pain. Um, where was your child been? The pain will gradually encompass the entire trunk of the body, including the back, including the chest, including the abdomen. And most people who have bad bites describe this as the worst pain they've ever experienced in their life. I've had women who've been bitten that tell me that childbirth is not as bad as the pain from a black widow spider. Fortunately, black widow venom is one of the best studied toxins of any arachnid, and there is an antivenom. This antivenin certainly can cause allergic reactions, but having seen bad bites that I've seen, having seen how fast this antivenin can work to completely take away your pain, there's no doubt in my mind that I would want to get that if I was faced with the type of pain that I see a lot of my patients get. Venoms are extremely complex chemicals, and developing an antidote is like cracking the spider's code. That's why this small house in America contains thousands of venomous spiders. It's home to Chuck and Anita Christensen, who, despite operating out of their front room, are the world's leading suppliers of spider venom. Uh, right now we've got about uh, 50,000, depending how you count them. If you want to count all the babies, maybe 100, 150,000, but uh, about 50,000 spiders in individual cups. Feeding 50,000 spiders is quite an operation, and right now it's feeding time at the zoo. This is a uh, Chinese earth tiger. And it's got a reputation amongst the locals for having a very nasty venom. 
it causes a uh, paralysis, and apparently, uh, um, and if it bites in the head region, it can kill a cow within a, a few hours. So over here, large cellar spiders. This has the most deadly venom of all spiders, according to the myth. But the reason why it doesn't affect us is the fangs are too small to bite people. And so that's one of our priorities, just to uh, find out what this, uh, this venom does and actually how toxic it is. Each species of spider has its own cocktail of toxins, many of which we simply do not understand. The bite of this spider, for example, occasionally causes a mysterious reaction that makes your flesh rot away. The brown recluse is a, a real mystery, okay? Um, they have a uh, inflammatory or necrotoxin that uh, can uh, cause uh, a lot of uh, inflammation at the bite site, as well as the tissue will just basically rot away. It's not the kind of spider you want to be chasing around the room. As you can tell, it's a very fast spider. Something about the spiders here, we don't know what, is causing these necrotic lesions. And there's been a lot of research on there, but it's still an amazing mystery about how these venoms actually work. To study the effects of venom, you need a constant supply. Anita uses a small electric shock to encourage the black widows to give up a tiny drop. Thanks to research like this, the threat posed by species like the black widow and funnel webs have been neutralized by the creation of anti-venoms. But these spiders are the devil we know. Lurking in the garden and invading the corner of our homes are animals with mysterious necrotoxins, flesh-rotting chemicals that science cannot explain. Analysis into the venom of the Australian white-tailed spider suggests that it's no more dangerous than a common house spider. But Helen Midgley has a different story to tell. This is where the old veggie patch was. It was brimming in those days. To get to the tomatoes, I had to walk into the pumpkin leaves, and that's where I got bitten. I had a bumper crop that year, and I thought I'd pick the rest of the crop because it was just about finished. When I plunged my leg through the pumpkin leaves, I was bitten, and uh, consequently, I don't have a veggie patch anymore because I'm too scared to, to come into this part of the garden. No one knows why, but one bite from this spider can set off outbreaks of rotting flesh all over the body. Amputation is sometimes the only cure. The plastic surgeon said to me that they would have to cut the area out surrounding the ulcer, which had gone gangrenous. And I thought, OK. And then the sister wanted me to sign a form. I was absolutely terrified when I saw this form and she explained it to me, that I would lose my foot if they couldn't fix it. And it was the most dreadful thing that I've ever had to go through. The symptoms that people like Helen have suffered are so complex that the medical community questions whether the spider can be wholly responsible. They've even suggested that the spider and the symptoms are unrelated. But Helen is gathering the experiences of others. It's a grim catalogue. I've had two toes amputated on my right foot. My foot just blew up. I had, if you like, two feet on one foot. My hand would swell enormously and then the skin would just peel off. People aren't feeling alone anymore because that's what I felt when I was bitten and I don't want anyone else to feel alone because the suffering with this spider bite is horrific. The white-tailed spider's venom is proving an especially difficult code to unravel. Maybe venom samples provided by a man like Chuck will hold the key a man who likes to spend his spare time watching the courting rituals of tarantulas. Come on, guy, the other way around. Come on, come on. We're back over here. We got some action down there now. Spider venom is designed to immobilize other bugs, 
it's pure chance that it can have such a devastating effect on us. When threatened, a spider may bite in self-defense, but they really have no interest in us. Excellent. But there are bugs out there whose only interest is us. These creatures are specifically designed to hunt us down. A body beautiful to you or I is to them a lush and fertile world waiting to be explored. Hands through the hair. Excellent. Okay. Holding that. All that. Gorgeous. All that. At huge magnification, parts of our skin look like a barren moonscape. But on the horizon, the hairs on our legs are ideal for colonization. The head of the tick is precisely designed to latch on to our skin. The level of disgust that we feel for these creatures depends on the intimacy of the relationship. In our more private parts, there are animals that can survive nowhere else. Claws of the crab louse can only grip the pubic hair of a human. On our heads, there may be lice. An average infestation is 20. A bad case may number thousands. But these creatures don't just inhabit us they feed off us. To many of them, we're just a big bag of blood. And there's nothing more nutritious than that. Some blood feeders don't live on our bodies. They are visitors. They track us down by the trail of carbon dioxide we exhale. They live nearby, waiting till we're fast asleep before coming out to feed. The bed bug used to live in caves feeding on mammals like bears and woolly rhinos. But today, they find our bedrooms much more comfortable. Their sharp mouth parts are designed to punch through skin, which at their scale is like elephant hide. These animals infested our past, but this is one intruder we've managed to control. Or so we thought. For some reason, they're coming back again, and we hear more and more cases of bed bugs being in fancy hotels or people's homes, et cetera, et cetera. We think that this is because there's less and less widespread spraying for cockroaches, and apparently that had killed a lot of bed bugs. But now that cockroach control consists of baiting and stuff like that, okay, bed bugs are back. Pull this back and take a look. Ah, okay, yeah, that's right. This is a brand new bed. Mm-hmm. You know, the stuff. Yeah. Remember the old one? We found the infestation. We found adult bed bugs stuck right in the crevices. Uh, crevices of your bed. This bed made its mark in medical history. Stephanie Marshall Penner woke in the middle of the night to discover she was living with a thousand bed bugs. I woke up one night to go to the ladies' room. I used a flashlight in the dark, and I was getting, pulled the blankets back, and I noticed to the left of me on the bed a bug, and it burst. It was blood all over my hands. Oh, yeah. So I freaked out. I got across to the, the light switch, turned the light on, and I saw this festation of all these little creepy crawlers on my comforter and underneath I looked mm. while, while my husband slept through it, facing his back to me. Stephanie has called in the San Francisco Department of Health to help her deal with the problem. They have a sickly sweet smell, and I don't know if you could smell that, but I smelled it right away. And it looks like someone, maybe your husband, got the pepper shaker, black pepper shaker, and it's like shaking sprinkled. spots and all exactly. over. Exactly. And that's their poop. That's their poop. poop I and right. that's uh, digested blood, your mm. blood. Yes. You were so surprised to find that they were in your picture frames and also... Uh -huh. Back here, where they have little cracks, half of the bed bug, half of the adult bed bug was right here. Uh-huh. Yeah, it's here. See, and they were also stuck this. here. Yeah. 
You would find baby bed buggers uh, underneath these things too, and mm -hmm. in the corners. You see any sign of infestation? Curtains along the windows. All you need is one pregnant female, you see. One pregnant mm -hmm. female is enough to do it. Got pregnant because some male punched her through the stomach. <laughs> okay. These bugs, I mean, they're idiotic. Did you know that the, they have males and females? But the males are so aggressive, they have different sex organs. But the male just punches his sex organ through the abdomen of the female oh my God. and deposits his sperm. And the female takes it. They do that constantly. And you know, some males, they don't know the difference between a male and a female. They're so <laughs> stupid. The male punches another male through the stomach and, you know, does that to him too. Oh, uh, so, you know, these bugs are very unusual. What they do is they come out at night when you're sleeping and they plug in just like a mosquito, boink. Uh -huh. And then they take a little sip, unplug, Doink. and then they walk up a few paces and they plug Hit you again. again. They take a little sip, unplug, and walk up. That's why bed bug bites are in a straight line because they, that's their habit. In South America, vampire bugs come in nightmarish proportions. This is the largest blood-sucking bug in the world. It's the kissing bug, so-called because it likes to feed from your lips. It also transmits a kind of sleeping sickness called Chagger's disease. But transmitting dangerous pathogens has nothing to do with size. There are bugs far smaller than this one which have changed the course of history. Inside this small package is one of the greatest blood hunters of them all. It can wait for a year before the sound of a footfall unleashes the beast from its cocoon. It's the flea. The flea's leap is a phenomenon. It can accelerate a hundred times faster than a space rocket, a feat that has made this animal a star. And now, the whirlwind chariot race. Who wants a bit? I'll have a nicker on number two. They're off. By the way, do you know that these chariots are roughly 100 times the weight of the fleas pulling them? What next, I wonder? From dexterity to strength, and Samson the mighty. It has been worked out, do you know, that this feat of strength is equivalent to a human being dragging an elephant round the outside of a cricket field. Famous for its strength, the flea is infamous for its bite. It spreads bubonic plague, a disease which can reach pandemic proportions. The first outbreak struck in 541 AD. It wiped out 35% of the population of southern Europe. In the 14th century, it was the cause of the Black Death that swept through London, killing half the inhabitants and broke out sporadically for another 300 years. The third pandemic burst out of China in 1892. It killed six million people in India alone. In the autumn of 1980, at this school in California, a primary school teacher died of plague. Only luck prevented her passing it to her 30 students. Most people think of plague as a thing of the Dark Ages, but it's still transmitted by fleas, between rodents like squirrels and rats. Plague is far from a historical curiosity. With the discovery of antibiotic-resistant strains elsewhere in the world, Plague, lurking on the edge of our cities, remains a serious concern. Scientists at California's Vector Control know they can't stop it, but they vigilantly monitor it. In a single year, 12 squirrels tested positive at this San Diego campground. But now, rodents, and therefore fleas, no longer have the same access to humans to be the threat they once were. 
It's a whole different story when a disease carrier is highly mobile and possesses the tracking capabilities of a guided missile. This is a supreme predator. You can run, but you cannot hide. By locking onto a plume of different smells, the mosquito can hunt you down from a hundred feet away. The mosquito uses a lot of signals to find you. To begin with, carbon dioxide that you emit as you breathe, things that are in your sweat, including lactic acid and various urea projects, all kinds of nice smelling things that indicate to a female mosquito that there's food around. You can't hide in the dark. At close range, she switches to a heat-seeking function, guiding her to where your blood pumps closest to the skin. Each year, the mosquito infects up to 300 million people with malaria alone. She will probe around, then she begins drawing blood up the central hypodermic syringe and feeds on the blood. And of course, at the same time, she's been using her saliva to facilitate uh, entry into the skin and to promote the movement of blood into herself. At Harvard Center for Disease Control, Paul Reiter keeps tabs on the long list of diseases carried by the mosquito. It's not just about malaria. A mosquito like this, Aedes aegypti, carries dengue and yellow fever throughout the world. Aedes aegypti is probably as domesticated as the cockroach or, or the housefly. It lives in close association with people. It only bites people. It doesn't waste its bites on other creatures. It's susceptible to the virus and it lives quite a long time. So all those factors make it into a very good transmitter of many infectious diseases. Imagine that our modern cities will keep us free from disease. But in the summer of 1999, an event took place that shattered this illusion of safety. A deadly brain swelling disease called West Nile fever broke out in New York City. The larvae that you see here are of Culex mosquitoes, of the species that are transmitting West Nile virus. If you had made a Hollywood movie of this rather surreal event, I think people would have found it a little bit hard to believe. A virus that's endemic in Africa, Asia, and Europe uh, suddenly arrives in New York. It almost seems unbelievable. Seven people died in a matter of months. A handful of new suspected cases and a horde of helicopters and trucks set to spray marks the latest in New York's battle against encephalitis. This weekend, choppers and trucks are headed to Brooklyn, Queens, the Bronx, and Manhattan to spread a dose of insecticide. The aim is to kill as many mosquitoes as possible. Yeah, you just don't know. Um, it'd be hard. If she, she can't talk yet, so you know, it'd be hard for us to know if, if she says, you know, something bit me or whatever. So it's a frightening thing to, to think that, you know, the littlest thing like a mosquito bite could, uh, could turn into something you. terrible. The residents were suddenly faced with a tiny but deadly invader. I'm telling you, at night, I can hear them. And it's, I don't know. I mean, I, I know everybody thinks, OK, well, it's now a virus. I'm not going to get it, but I'm telling you, I can hear them. I can hear them at night. Um, there could be some holes in the screens. This is a very old house. This is Brooklyn. And um, I believe there's some holes in the screens. I, don't, I think this fan has something to do with it. I'm not sure, but it's, there's one right there. Oh, he just left. They're huge. I'll show you a bite. There's one. Wait, there was one on my foot. 
right here. Do you see that? Right there. That's West Nile, I think. Actually, I, I, I don't think so. I mean, I just, it's a mosquito bite. The mosquitoes are definitely in my house. Yeah. Yeah, they're definitely, can you hear them? I don't think there's any in here right now. The West Nile virus caught us napping. It was a reminder of how a minor irritant can transform itself quickly into a deadly adversary. Health officials say they will continue spraying across the city, including Central Park, until both viruses and the mosquitoes carrying them are wiped out. At Central Park, J. Dow, New York One. Mosquito control is a global campaign. In southern Florida alone, up to 1,800 gallons of insecticide are sprayed in a single week. This is not about eradication. Just keeping mosquito populations here in check is the best they can hope for. dream of a bug-free world is just that. There's no getting away from it. There's no getting away from them. Bugs are affecting our lives in ways we're only just beginning to understand. Bugs bite us and poison us. They give us disease and eat our food. They're living on our faces. But as we delve deeper to find ways to fight them, we're just starting to uncover another side to these invaders. In New Mexico, bees are being trained to hunt down landmines. And even that ancient insect product honey has been discovered to be the only known cure for antibiotic-resistant bacteria. Maggots, once the most reviled of all bugs, are now cleaning wounds. And the tiny wasps being trained in Atlanta may soon use their super sense to sniff out invisible cancers in the human body. We'd do well to remember that our downfall and our salvation may be held within the bug's world.